3. The Doctrine of Grace in the Church. The teachings of Scripture respecting the grace of God stress the fact that God distributes His blessings to men in a free and sovereign manner, and not in consideration of any inherent merit of men, that men owe all the blessings of life to a beneficent, forbearing, and long-suffering God, and especially that all the blessings of the work of salvation are freely given of God, and are in no way determined by supposed merits of men. This is clearly expressed by Paul in the following words, For by grace have ye been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, that no man should glory, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. He strongly emphasizes the fact that salvation is not by works, Romans 3 verses 20 to 28, for verse 16, Galatians 2 verse 16. This doctrine did not go entirely unchallenged. In some of the early church fathers, particularly of the Eastern Church, we already meet with a strain of moralism that is not in harmony with the Pauline emphasis. The tendency that became apparent in that section of the church finally culminated in Pelagianism. Pelagius' conception of grace was rather unusual. According to Wiggers, he comprehended under grace a the power of doing good, possibilitas boni, and therefore especially free will itself. b the revelation, the law, and the example of Christ, by which the practice of virtue is made easier for man. c our being so made as to be able, by our own will, to abstain from sin and in God's giving us the help of his law and his commands, and in his pardoning the previous sins of those who returned to him. d. Supernatural influences on the Christian, by which his understanding is enlightened and the practice of virtue is rendered easy to him. Augustinism and Pelagianism, pp. 179-183. He recognized no direct operation of the Spirit of God on the will of man, but only an indirect operation on the will through the enlightened conscience. In his view the operation of the grace of God was primarily, though not exclusively, external and natural. In opposition to the Pelagian view, that of Augustine is often designated as the theology of grace. While Augustine admitted that the word grace could be used in a wider sense, natural grace, and that even in the state of integrity it was the grace of God that made it possible for Adam to retain his uprightness. His main emphasis is always on grace as the gift of God to fallen man, which manifests itself in the forgiveness of sin and in the renewal and sanctification of human nature. In view of the total depravity of man he regards this grace as absolutely necessary unto salvation. It is wrought in man by the operation of the Holy Spirit, who dwells and works in the elect and is the principle of all the blessings of salvation. He distinguished between operating or provenient, and cooperating or subsequent grace. The former enables the will to choose the good, and the latter cooperates with the already enabled will, to do the good. In his struggle with Semipelagianism Augustine emphasized the entirely gratuitous and irresistible character of the grace of God. In the subsequent struggles the Augustinian doctrine of grace was only partly victorious. Seberg expresses himself as follows, thus the doctrine of grace alone came off victorious but the Augustinian doctrine of predestination was abandoned. The irresistible grace of predestination was driven from the field by the sacramental grace of baptism. History of Doctrine, I, page 382. During the Middle Ages the scholastics paid considerable attention to the subject of grace, but did not always agree as to the details of the doctrine. Some approached the Augustinian, and others the Semipelagian conception of grace. In general it may be said that they conceived of grace as mediated through the sacraments, and that they sought to combine with the doctrine of grace a doctrine of merit which seriously compromised the former. The emphasis was not on grace as the favor of God shown to sinners, but on grace as a quality of the soul, which might be regarded as both uncreated, i.e., as the Holy Spirit, or as increated, or wrought in the hearts of men by the Holy Spirit. This infused grace is basic to the development of the Christian virtues, and enables man to acquire merit with God, to merit further grace, though he cannot merit the grace of perseverance. This can only be obtained as a free gift of God. The scholastics did not, like Augustine, maintain the logical connection between the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of predestination. The reformers went back to the Augustinian conception of grace, but avoided his sacramentarianism. They placed the emphasis once more on grace as the unmerited favor of God shown to sinners, and represented it in a manner which excluded all merit on the part of the sinner. Says Smeaton, 
the term grace, which in Augustine's acceptation intimated the inward exercise of love, awakened by the operations of the Holy Spirit, Romans 5 verse 5, and which in the scholastic theology had come to denote a quality of the soul, or the inner endowments, and infused habits of faith, love, and hope, was now taken in the more scriptural and wider sense for the free, the efficacious favor which is in the divine mind. The Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, page 346. While the Reformers used the term grace in connection with justification, in other connections they often used the phrase, the work of the Holy Spirit, instead of the term grace. While they all emphasized grace in the sense of the internal and saving operation of the Holy Spirit, Calvin especially developed the idea of common grace, that is, a grace which, while it is the expression of the favor of God, does not have a saving effect. According to the splendid dogma historical study of Dr. H. Kuiper on Calvin on Common Grace, pp. 179 ff, he even distinguished three kinds of common grace, namely, universal common grace, general common grace, and covenant common grace. The Arminians departed from the doctrine of the Reformation on this point. According to them God gives sufficient, common, grace to all men, and thereby enables them to repent and believe. If the human will concurs or cooperates with the Holy Spirit and man actually repents and believes, God confers on man the further grace of evangelical obedience and the grace of perseverance. Thus the work of the grace of God is made to depend on the consent of the will of man. There is no such thing as irresistible grace. Says Smeaton in the work. Already quoted, it was held that every one could obey or resist, that the cause of conversion was not the Holy Spirit so much as the human will concurring or cooperating, and that this was the immediate cause of conversion. Page 357. Amiraldus of the school of Sorma did not really improve on the Armenian position by his assumption, in connection with the general decree of God, that the sinner, while devoid of the moral ability, yet has the natural ability to believe, an unfortunate distinction, which was also carried over into New England by Edwards, Bellamy, and Fuller. Pagan, a disciple of Amaraldus, denied the necessity of the work of the Holy Spirit in the internal illumination of sinners, in order to their saving conversion. The only thing which he regarded as necessary was that the understanding, which has in itself a sufficiency of clear ideas, should be struck by the light of external revelation. Bishop Warburton in his work on the doctrine of grace, or the office and operations of the Holy Spirit knows of no saving grace in the accepted sense of the word, but limits the word, grace, to the extraordinary operations of the Spirit in the apostolic age. And Junkheim in his important work denied the supernatural character of God's work in the conversion of the sinner, and affirmed that the moral power of the word effected all the Methodist revival in England and the Great Awakening in our own country brought with them a restoration of the doctrine of saving grace, though in some cases tinged more or less with Arminianism. For Schleiermacher the problem of the guilt of sin was practically non-existent, since he denied the objective existence of guilt. And consequently he knows little or nothing of the saving grace of God. Says Mackintosh, this central biblical truth, of divine mercy to sinners, Schleiermacher for the most part passes by in silence, or mentions only in a perfunctory fashion that shows how little he understands it. Types of Modern Theology, page 96. The doctrine of divine grace is also necessarily obscured in the theology of Albrecht Ritschel. And it may be said to be characteristic of the whole of modern liberal theology, with its emphasis on the goodness of man, that it has lost sight of the necessity of the saving grace of God. The word, grace, has gradually disappeared from the written and spoken word of many. Theologians, and many of the common people in our day attach no other meaning to the term than that of gracefulness or graciousness. Even Otto calls attention to it in his work on the idea of the holy that people fail to sense the deeper meaning of the word. pp 32 ff, 145. The theology of crisis deserves credit for stressing anew the need of divine grace, with the result that the word is once more coming into use, 